for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Me and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, well, I've been in the microscope world for many, many years. I remember as a 16 year old, I traveled uh, all the way from San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, where I spent many years growing up to an island off the coast of uh, Portland, Maine, to the National Youth Science Foundation. And I spent a summer there on that island uh, working with microscopes and looking at planktonic algae. And uh, so that's when I got bought a bit, <laughs> bit by the microscope bug. And uh, at the University of Florida, I studied plant pathology, which uses a lot of microscopes. And uh, then I went into a career in microscopy. Um, for many years and then uh, went back to school and got my master's degree uh, in, in parasitology. I studied under the late uh, Dr. Richard Lumsden, who was dean of the graduate school at Tulane University and a uh, world-class microscopist. Um, his papers uh, still referenced to this day, written in the 60s, late 60s and 70s. So that was quite an education and then um, uh, then I went back to school to Liberty University, graduated out of the doctoral program at the School of Education with educational specialists. So, um, but I've spent many years working for microscope companies. I worked for Carl Zeiss, for Olympus, for Reichert, uh, and others, and uh, ran my own business for many years. And then I taught in academia. Uh, I ran several, I think uh, seven total electron microscopes labs uh, I've built and run over the years and uh, my most recent appointment was at California State University Northridge uh, in Northridge, California where I ran a million dollar microscopy lab there so that in a nutshell is me. Awesome Mark, that's great and uh, would you be able to tell our audience that might be new to some of your work how your discoveries have changed the way we look at dinosaur fossils? Well um, I don't know how my discoveries have helped other people uh, change their views. Uh, it certainly has changed my view. Um, you know, I became interested uh, in soft tissue when I was in my uh, master's program in parasitology. Um, I trained to become a soft tissue expert uh, for microscopy. You, you can't just throw any old tissue under the microscope. It has to be processed carefully following a whole uh, rigorous protocol. And so, um, uh, I was in the throes of uh, working with animal tissues and preserving them and preparing them for electron microscopy and examining them under the electron microscope when I became aware of dinosaur soft tissues. And I was really intrigued because uh, all of the protocols that were being described in the journals were things that I was doing routinely in my lab. So I thought, wow, this is something I could do. Um, and so uh, that became of great interest to me, which later to prove very interesting uh, at California State University later on. That's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I heard what happened, unfortunately, but we'll get to that soon. I hear you've, uh, <laughs> I hear you, uh, that Mary Schweitzer herself actually served as an editor and reviewer of your Journal of Structural Biochemistry paper. So your work is published in both the Microspacy Society of America in 2014 and published in the Journal of Microspacy Today in 2016. So why does the public think that dinosaur soft tissue is somehow a creationist research propaganda? Well, um, I can't speak for how other people uh, feel about propaganda or otherwise, um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I have a rich publication history. Um, I think you can see some of the journal covers on the wall behind me there. I've had something like 16 or 18 journal covers, uh, including soft tissue uh, with parasites that were published in journals, uh, in journal covers. Um, and uh, so what... When I was at uh, California State University Northridge running the, the microscopy laboratory for the biology department there, um, I, be, I became interested in this uh, phenomenon of soft tissues, and so I got invited on a dinosaur dig, and I thought, well, yeah, no, I definitely want to do that. So we uh, drove up to Montana. It's a two-day drive. We spent three days digging. Uh, we didn't find much. We found a lot of remnants of Triceratops. The area we were digging in is well known for, for Triceratops. It's a common fossil there. In fact, the, the Triceratops horn that we found finally on the last day, we were led to by Marge Beish uh, because she has this thousand-acre ranch, and uh, many people have dug there. Jack Horner has dug there. Mary Schweitzer 
her team and others have dug there and uh, many valuable finds have been recovered from the Hell Creek Formation there on the Bay Ranch. But she led us right to this horn. It took us eight hours to dig it out of the ground. It had been ripped away from the skull and it was pointed down into the ground. So all the vessels at the end of the bone, and I can actually show you a base of the bone here. You can actually see, it's rather heavy, but I'll hold it up. You can actually see the blood vessels in the center there, all those little holes. Those are all the blood vessels in the center of the bone. So we found this horn. I took it back to my laboratory. Um, I cracked it open and I found um, actual sheets of fiber or bone that I could stretch into the microscope. And of course, that was the title of the paper uh, that we submitted for publication. Shot, soft sheets of fiber. Need a microscope. You didn't need a microscope to extract that though, those sheets. Correct. No, uh, I uh, the, the the horn was heavily fractured. It, it was it was really weathered. Um, remember, it was sitting two feet from the surface uh, of the soil in Montana, where there's a freeze thaw cycle every year. There's water yes. percolating, snow, ice. Um, you have plant roots. You have fungal hyphae and fibers going in there. You have insects, microbes, bacteria. Uh, rodents. Uh, we did a blast DNA analysis where we took some of the, the matrix or dirt around the bone and we tested it for DNA and we found the DNA of 33 different organisms. So this bone was under huge attack for who knows how long. And so we didn't, when we recovered it, I thought, wow, I'm not going to find anything in this. And yet I found this soft, stretchy bone that I was able to just peel off of the inside. I fractured the bone open and exposed the horn, the horn core which is the very center of the horn, and inside that I just peeled away. And you can see some of this video on the YouTube channel where I'm peeling that off the bone. Anyway, we, we, uh, we thin-sectioned that. I thin-sectioned it under a cryostat, uh, which told the whole world, hey, this is soft. If you can cut something on a cryostat, it's already soft. You didn't have to do anything. So I peeled it off. I put it on this cryostat. I thin-sectioned it, and I saw uh, stacks of cells. So remember, it's a three-dimensional piece of tissue. I found stacks of cells in there all lined up and ordered together, just like they, they are in regular compact bone. And so this soft sheet of bone uh, is a precursor to the bone that's later made by all the cells that are in there by filling it in with bone mineral. So, yeah, there's no way that um, uh, that, that could have been a biofilm, which is one of the arguments. Hey, this is just a biofilm. This isn't soft tissue. But biofilms don't replicate sheets of tissue with all these cells in there stacked up on top of each other in 3D conformation. So that, that destroys the biofilm argument. But no, I mean, it was, it was submitted for peer review. Dr. Schweitzer was an editor and reviewer on the paper. She made comments. Um, and this is no surprise. That was her comments were published in Nature. So um, and a lot of uh, very well-qualified people reviewed the paper before it was published. And you've worked with Mary Schweitzer, and you and her are friends, aren't you? And and as you you have many like uh, I hear that you are friends. Are you friends? Are you and Mary? No, I've never met Mary Schweitzer. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I think okay. We emailed each other one time. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, but she just sort of did some work for you on the book, and yeah, reviewing reviewing it, peer reviewing it. Yeah, she was one of the peer reviewers on the paper. So so okay. folks that criticize. Uh, my work are actually really criticizing Mary Schweitzer's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mary, I mean, I like Mary Schweitzer and, and and her work. I don't agree with her conclusions, but I like her work. And and that iron preservation that was a uh, that that um, you gave a rundown on that and why? Uh, could you explain? Well, yeah, I mean, before we get to the iron preservation, though, um, I, think it's important right. to, I think it's important to share with everyone that uh, my lab has uh, been, you know, active in producing world first. We were the first ones to find uh, soft tissues, including osteocytes, uh, vessels, and other structures inside of a triceratops horn. Now, remember, the horn was ripped away from the skull violently, so it was not articulated they're saying that many of the best cells come from articulated specimens where they're, you know, they're still sort of connected in the soil where they, where, where they were buried. Um, but a horn is, 
is not articulated. It's ripped away. Um, so it's really subjected to the environment. Um, and it doesn't have uh, the deep bone protection uh, that, that you find in all, all of the uh, uh, discoveries or most of the discoveries to date have been collected from long bone. And so that's what we were searching for when we went to Hell Creek. We were looking for long bones, but we couldn't find any. So we came away with the horn not knowing that we have probably found uh, the most highly preserved cells and structures inside this horn, and yet it was ripped away from the rest of the body and subjected to the environment. So, um, yeah, I mean, when you talk about iron preservation, you're assuming an intact body that is not hemorrhaging out into the matrix. And so, and yeah. so uh, you know, iron is, is one of the top five elements in, in the crust of the planet. So it's not surprising that we find iron everywhere. And uh, many of the tissues that have been looked at to date uh, are coated with iron, but it doesn't mean that the iron preserved them. It, it could mean that uh, iron in the environment or iron from the blood, uh, you know, may have uh, come, come out of the proteins that they're encapsulated within, you know, uh, uh, hemoglobin is a very highly encapsulated molecule that holds on to the iron because uh, iron, free iron in the body is destructive. Just look at COVID-19, okay? Everybody, nobody, nobody's really talking about the fact that COVID-19 attacks hemoglobin. It, it yeah. gains entry into the red blood cells and it literally frees iron into the body. Mm -hmm all over the body and that's why you get uh, all this tissue destruction all this organ yeah. destruction so so in that in that sense uh, 2.9 billion experiments have been conducted uh freeing iron into tissue systems over the last four months and look at the path of destruction and death so uh we we know that fenton reactions is a result of free iron and tissue systems in combination with water is a loose cannon. I mean, I, I, I reference many of these papers in my talks and in my writings that show that uh, the hydroxyl ions that are released as a result of Fenton reactions are way more destructive than any of their uh, uh, cross-linking and structural, you know, integrity properties. Uh, they tear away more than they build. So. Uh, but there's there's other problems with the iron preservation theory. I think the advanced glycolication end product theory is probably more likely because what we see and when, when, when you look in forensics, I mean, you study forensic medicine, they talk about grave wax. And so all these fats that are in these tissues just kind of congeal and harden and, and close in on themselves over time. So um, I think that's probably a more likely preservation mechanism than the iron. Well, I mean, the Triceratops horn is just what you're most famous for, but you found dinosaur soft tissue in multiple things, right? I mean, didn't you find a, uh, uh, under, from a museum drawer, you found a hundred year old dinosaur bone and you extracted material from that too, right? Yeah, that was back uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Joe Taylor from Crosbyton, Texas, uh, uh, knew that I had an electron microscope and he sent me a piece of a T-Rex uh, hip bone. And uh, not knowing any better because I was new to the field, I just cracked it in half, coated it with metal, and put it under my scanning electron microscope, and we showed all these collagen fibers that were still present. So that was back in the early 2000s. But since then, you know, I've been on three digs, and we've collected Nanotyrannus. We've, from, from Triceratops, we've collected, obviously, the horn, the frill, which is the big bone on the back of the skull, uh, we've collected the, the condyle, which is the baseball-shaped um, uh, bone that uh, attaches the skull to the vertebral column. Remember, a triceratops has its vertebral column horizontally, and the, the skull hangs off of that vertebral column. So that ball joint in there allows the skull to pivot. And, and this skull is, is considered one of the largest terrestrial skulls known. So to hang all that weight, off of that uh, uh, vertebral column, you need this big ball. So we, we found this big condom. They're common. They're all over the place in Hell Creek. Uh, and it was loaded with tissue. We, we found a rib which had tissue. In fact, every single bone from every single dig that we have processed um, has come up with soft tissue. In fact, there's a really neat uh, paper uh, that came out just this year 
uh, by Andrew Reist and Curry uh, up in Canada, and they studied uh, 19 bone specimens that were removed from the collection there at the University of Alberta. Uh, they took bones right out of the collection and processed them, and, and, and 15 of those 19 were dinosaur bones, and all 19 of those produced soft tissue. So that, that's why I made my prediction back in 2012 that soft tissue would be the norm in the fossil record rather than the exception, and I think we're starting to see that. Hey, hey can I jump in here real quickly? Go ahead. Yes. Sure. Uh, uh, I've heard of the controversy over nanotyrannus. I, I want to get your opinion. Do you think it's its own genus, or do you think it, it's a juvenile tyrannosaurus? Oh, that's a good question. That's a well, not, not being a paleontologist, I'm eminently not qualified to comment on whether or not nanotyrannus is a new species. I think it's yeah. exciting. I think there are differences that, um, that make it different and special. I think the number of teeth uh, and other things, other factors, but I'm not, you know, I have, that's not my area of expertise. I'm a microscopist, but uh, the, the idea of uh, a, a nanotyrannus type uh, dinosaur is exciting to me um, because it's meaner, uh, leaner, faster. It, it seems to, to have been able to run really fast uh, in contrast to T-Rex, which is more of a plodding organism. Uh, but yeah, not being a paleontologist, I'm not qualified to, to enter that fray. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. I would have loved to have heard your opinion on it, but yeah, no. Otherwise, you'll get jumped on by about ten thousand other people if you do. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> better not to. I understand completely. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a good question though. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, Matt, so you you you're up, mate. Do you know by any chance where you've been uh, digging in that Hell's Creek formation on that property that you mentioned? Have you ever noticed, has anybody ever mentioned that buffalo fossils have been discovered in that region, or is it mostly just a Triceratops graveyard? No, it's it's known in the literature as a Triceratops graveyard, um, and there's there's a T-Rex is pretty abundant. There's a lot of turtles um, and, and a lot of other debris. It's all it's all mud flow. It's all washed in, you know, uh, as a huge mud flow. Uh but uh, no, I, I've never heard of bison um, um, uh, compare, you know, it's certainly uh, described as, as common at Hell Creek. Uh, tri Triceratops is definitely common, and, and Marge Beige has a little museum herself right there, and there are dozens of, of uh, brow horns and condyles and other things that she's uh, collected. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't really understand the comparison to the bison horn, because the bison horn, as far as I know, uh, is a hollow sheath. I mean, it's basically a keratin shield that uh, is left after the bison expires. Uh, now, we do uh, believe that Triceratops horn, horns were covered in a hard sheath, uh, but none of that ever survives. You, no one has ever found the keratin sheath from a Triceratops horn. Um, you, you see sometimes the black remains of it. it's kind of a powdery, almost carbonized remains, but uh, no sheath has ever been found. But as I as I shown to you, I mean, the, the Triceratops horn is solid bone. I mean, it's just a solid chunk of bone uh, through and through. It's it's mostly compact bone, and the trabecular bone is only here in the center where the vessels are. So, um, yeah, I, I don't really understand the comparison between the bison horn and the triceratops horn. This thing was 46 inches long, by the way. I, I don't think, and the girth the girth on it at the bottom where we found it in the ground was about 12 inches. Right now, this piece is about nine inches in diameter. Well, I think when the critics are comparing the horn in size and shape, they're, they're looking, they just show one picture of a particular triceratops. They don't actually go online and look at all the massive varieties of different horns that are in triceratops, right? The species yeah. is huge. Yeah, no, you make a really good point. And there's also, uh, you know, ontogenic progression. So we see as, a, as an organism ages, you know, uh, the, the, the horns actually change angle over time uh, as they lengthen and they bow more over time. So um, there is variation, high variation, which uh, shouldn't be mistaken as different species. There's changes in these bones over the lifespan of the organism. Yeah, do you plan on going back for any more material anytime soon? Oh, I'd love to go back. In fact, uh, one of our goals at DISTRI, which is the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute, 
is to dig all over the world. Um, you know, our feeling is that um, these, uh, and it's being shown, uh, is that, that dinosaur soft tissue uh, is global. Um, I mean, Dr. Schweitzer found evidence of cells in Argentina, Gigantosaurus down there, and uh, of course, Canada, other places around the world, even Morocco. I mean, Morocco, which is well known for trilobites, is uh, now I've seen a report of soft tissue out of Morocco. So, I mean, uh, we want to dig in as many places as we possibly can because th th this information, we give it all for free. We don't, we don't sell anything. Even our books that we produce, we give them away. People need to know this. They need to know that the whole earth is covered by a cellophane wrap of dinosaur soft tissue. Um, this has tremendous implications for life and society. Um, That'd be and awesome. Weekly, people funding. need to know this. It'd be awesome if you could get the funding to do all the experiments that you need to do, like the radiation experiments, and, and, and get the scientists that you need and be able to pay for the scientists that you need to come in and do these experiments. Because if you could prove that these things 100% without a shadow of a doubt cannot possibly be, uh, you know, six, even 6 million years old uh, or even, t even probably 10,000 years old, then you, that would, you know, you can imagine the implications of that. that evolution would be finished instantly. I mean, the, the, the doctrine of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not a confrontationalist, and I really no, I don't, don't understand that. Yes. I don't try to make this confrontational, but I'll tell you to us what the story of dinosaur tissue is for mankind, and, and I think it's really appropriate for times such as this, where the whole world is gripped by the panic of a of a possible, uh, you know, systemic disease that that is an existential threat to the human race. I mean, this really gives one pause about you know who you are. Uh, where you are in your lifespan and where you could end up uh, if things don't go the way you want. So uh, it really is forcing people, I think, to ask the big questions. And, and I think dinosaur stuff tissue answers that question. If, if dinosaurs, which are purported to be millions and millions of years old, are full of soft tissue, um, and, and we know soft tissue uh, innately, everybody understands that soft tissue uh, doesn't last a long time. It's laid by. It changes. It breaks down. Just throw a, a chicken leg out in the front yard for, for a month and watch what happens. I mean, it breaks down. It goes away. And so people are shocked when they find out that dinosaur bones are full of soft tissue and beautiful soft. We're finding nerve uh, bundles, uh, uh, which is not surprising because they travel together with the veins and the the, uh, the arteries uh, inside a bone. But we're finding the nerves that travel with that. We're finding the vein valves that are that are controlling the flow of that blood inside the vein as it returns to the heart. I mean, uh, people innately understand that if these tissues are there, they cannot be that old. Therefore, therefore, this validates the the Genesis account of the global flood. I mean, it says, yeah, all this stuff was buried at one time. Even the Permian stuff that we're looking at looks even more preserved. I probably shouldn't be talking about it, but that's something that we're working on. So, I mean, as far back as you go in these specimens, you know, we, we, we uh, Jim Soliday, uh, one of our um, uh, scientists here at District, uh, he found blood cells in a Devonian lungfish vertebrate uh, 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 slide. And so uh, just recently, Dr. Schweitzer found uh, chromosomes, uh, you know, here in December 2019, she's discussing uh, mechanisms of preservation, and um, I'm sorry, I may have those, I may have those, uh, I've been reading so many papers lately, I just get so confused, but recently had a paper that showed uh, uh, chromosomes lined up across uh, a metaphase plate, uh, and with tremendous uh, uh, preservation, so people understand that this stuff doesn't last for a long time, therefore if the flood is true, then, then the book of Genesis is true. Uh, the, the story of Eden, uh, the story of the first two humans that were placed on this pl planet is true. And so in that sense, we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all in the same family. Now, some of us have strayed. And it's up to us to, to go and invite those folks to come back in. And here's the evidence to show them that this is believable. If that's important, do you want to go get the that door? Was that your doorbell that was ringing? Yeah, can I do that real quick? Is that okay? Yeah, go, go, go. go I'll go, be right back. Go. All right, so let's just talk while he's 
over there taking yeah. care of some business. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you have any extra comments, anybody, to make on all yeah. that? Yeah, for the audience listening, uh, Devonian lungfish supposedly, according to the theory of evolution, lived 400 million years ago. That's much oh, wow. older than dinosaur. So if they're pulling flesh, fresh blood tissue and samples out of that, that is extremely, extremely yeah. destructive to the theory. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. That's uh, that's actually uh, one of the illustrators for our new book. Um, <laughs> So we have a, a, a second version of Old Stretchy, the Dinosaur Bone Cell that's in preparation, and uh, we hope to get it on the website as soon as possible. Oh, uh, yeah, that'll be great. I, wanna, I can't wait to get the other book. I'm going to get that as soon as I can, as soon as this COVID-19 lockdown is over, and we can start getting things from overseas again. I'm buying it straight away. Yeah. Well, really, I don't know how many we're, we're going to publish, but we certainly can put it online for free. So. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I, I want the paperback. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed you had a book like on your website, a paperback. Um, I yeah, think yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think there was. Is there a paperback on your website? So uh, there was one book on there that I saw. Well, it's it's a PDF, it. so you can download it. You can print it yourself, or you can oh, take it to or something and, and have it printed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or just oh, just okay. transmit it electronically. People can read it on their computer. Yeah, it's PDF. Free. Yeah. Yeah. Totally free. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. I got a question for you. Have you ever tested any uh, Denisovian or uh, Neanderthal bones or fossils by any chance? No, I've only worked uh, mostly with Triceratops, Neanderthalus, T. Rex. Um, I have been working with other organisms of late, but uh, it's too early to talk about those. But um, no, I've never worked on. Actually, I did. I did work on one human bone. It was the same publication. That talked about the um, uh, that, that demonstrated the collagen fibers in the T. Rex uh, hip bone, and that was uh, Moab man uh, or Malachite man. Uh, Joe Taylor sent me a sample of that also, but that, that's the only human bone that I've ever worked on. Uh, fire away, guys! If you have any more. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about the iron preservation theory, maybe a little more in depth, and and some other things that we're considering. Um, as you know, there are uh, two predominant preservation theories uh, being offered. Uh, uh, the other theory, which was uh, uh, promoted for a while, was the biofilm theory. Um, uh, and, then, and then initially, in the very beginning, there was a contamination theory. But you know, in order to have contamination of osteocyte cells in bone, uh, particularly in a dinosaur bone, let's say you know, a dinosaur bone gets contaminated by invading osteocytes. I mean, it's preposterous because they'd have to crawl out of some other bone that was just dead or just died. You know, a bird crashed and smashed his wing and, you know, the bone cells crawled out, crawled across the dirt, crawled into the dinosaur bone and took up residence. So, yeah, no, the, the contamination theory, um, you know, for, at least for osteocytes, didn't hold water for very long. But then the biofilm theory came along and, and there were, uh, some very elegant experiments that Dr. Schweitzer's team conducted that showed that uh, certain proteins that are only found in vertebrates uh, that are not found in bacteria, uh, because biofilms are uh, the remnants of bacteria, sort of a uh, sugary goo that they produce to inhabit while they're colonizing uh, an area. Um, and, and the theory was that those biofilms uh, – later on, you know, became the osteocytes, which uh, we talked about previously, it's impossible. But, but certain proteins were found like uh, actin and tubulin and histone, which are, are DNA wrapping proteins. The DNA molecule gets wrapped up and forms these X's and Y's that we see. And those proteins that wrap up uh, DNA, histones, uh, were found by Schweitzer's team in the T-Rex. So uh, there's been some very sophisticated work done showing that the original or what we call endogenous molecules are still present. Um, but um, uh, in terms of preservation, um, the only examples that have been offered are the iron preservation theory, and there's a specific terminology for it. Um, I wrote it down somewhere, but uh, let's see if I can remember it here. Uh, transition metal catalyzed intermolecular cross-linking of structural proteins. Okay, what does that mean? That means basically that iron is freed from the blood cells or some other 
source. So there's a lot of iron bound in ferritin, for example. So somehow the iron becomes free, and when it comes in contact with oxygen in water, it produces hydroxyl, hydroxyl radicals, uh, which are like scrubbing bubbles. I mean, if you picture spraying, you know, a bathroom, a, a shower stall with scrubbing bubbles, you know, it foams up. And so I kind of picture uh, the iron coming out of the blood uh, into the into the blood vessel. Uh, you know, the, the air is in there because the the, the body's decomposing and water is infiltrating, so all these scrubbing bubbles are forming, and they're going, going through and chewing up the tissue like Pac-Man, and a lot of papers show that. And so, but the thinking is that somehow these hydroxyl radicals go into the structural proteins, the collagen fibers and the elastin fibers that are in the vessel, and that's what this paper is is discussing. It's not discussing the osteocytes. This is only discussing vessels, because the osteocytes have a whole different anatomy. Uh, they have the phospholipid bilayer membrane, you know, the, the cell membrane is basically a fatty layer. And so uh, hydroxyl radicals uh, chew that up like butter. And so cells just uh, are chewed up by hydroxyl radicals very quickly. So, so they're, they're making progress trying to explain the preservation of vessels uh, through this cross-linking. But one of the big problems is that uh, only every third or fourth um, amino acid in these proteins is cross-linked with another amino acid. So, so you have those remaining three or four in there that are gonna decompose through autolysis over time. In fact, Mary Schweitzer very early on commented that autolysis is a really difficult thing to get past because it starts immediately at death and cells just disintegrate as a result of autolysis. So, you know, as a tissue processing expert, I don't know why these cells are still here. But you can't explain their preservation based on fentanyl reactions in hydroxyl ions going through and cross-linking proteins. It's just going to chew up the cells. The other uh, preservation motif that's offered is this degradation that we talked about, about lipids uh, into advanced glycation end products. So uh, other than those two things, there's nothing proffered by anyone that ex can explain why these soft tissues are not completely disintegrated even as you say, after 10,000 years. You mentioned yesterday, I think, before I butchered the, uh, the actual stream, is that uh, somebody actually found brain tissue. Is that right? Um, did I mention that yesterday? Because I don't recall. I, I don't, we have found neural peripheral nerve tissue, of course, but it's, uh, it's really not peripheral because it's traveling in the bone. But we have found nerve tissue in the bone. But um, I know that they've tried to reconstruct a lot of the brains by injecting, uh, you know, uh, epoxy into brain case uh, spaces, but I don't, I don't know. Have, have you read a report about brain being found in dinosaur? Uh, I believe so, but I'll have to check back on that. It was a, it was a while ago now. Um, so, do you ever suspect that uh, full preserved DNA will be found? Do you think we'll be able to make a Jurassic Park in the future? No, I don't. I think there's too much degradation. I mean, DNA remnants have been found in Dr. Schweitzer and, and uh, ourselves. We've replicated some of that work. In fact, the vein valves that uh, we found from the veins uh, from the Triceratops bone uh, do react to an intercalating dye, uh, uh, acridine orange, which is a, a nuclear stain. It, what it does is it goes in and it, uh, it goes into the double helix or the single helix and it attaches there. So RNA or DNA is marked by this stain and it glows red under fluorescence, but um, um, we haven't done any immunohistochemistry, um, uh, but that, there's a lot of potential for uh, finding of these specific proteins with immunohistochemistry. That's one thing that we'd like to do with the lab. And let me take a minute, if I can, to just talk about DISTRI. Uh, the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute is a nonprofit organization that is chartered uh, in Texas, and um, it, th this is not about the people who are running it right now. This is about the people who are going to come along uh, in the future and turn this into a real bona fide brick and mortar laboratory where dinosaur soft tissue can be studied uh, at length and at leisure, uh, depending, of course, on funding. But we feel that this is a really important thing to do, and as a scientific organization, we're we're all mostly volunteers. Uh, in fact, we're all volunteers. I don't think, no, we don't pay anybody for anything. So we're all <laughs> volunteers and we give everything away. 
so we are completely dependent on uh, the Lord's uh, provision for us. But if donors want to step up, we have a wonderful charter set up. Uh, um, we're, we have IRS uh, 501c3 designation, and we're chartered in the state of Texas. So we have the ability to actually build a brick-and-mortar facility and, uh, and continue these studies uh, for years and years and years to come. That's awesome. Didn't you say it's a good cause? Definitely a good cause. Um, sorry, sorry, Matt. Gone. Oh no, no. I was just going to say. I heard you say before too that you'll actually teach people what you do. You'll actually bring them in and instruct them and get, guide them. Yeah. How somebody go about doing that? Well, absolutely. There, there's a lot of talented, capable people who uh, can serve as microscope technicians or just paleontological technicians. Um, so yeah, it would be a learning center. And I, I'm teaching a group right now in Pennsylvania how to work with these bones and decalcify them and collect the tissues from them. So we envision really a cooperation with a local university where we could have uh, professors come in and uh, design experiments and conduct experiments and bring in students and technicians. Uh, uh, imagine the learning that can go on in a place like that where you have a local university or college assisting um, and publishing uh, gaining all that experience through publication. And then as the lab grows, we would have, you know, a, 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 a radioactivity department where we're looking at carbon-14 or uh, taphonomy department where we're actually conducting uh, uh, fossilization experiments. Um, so there, there's a whole host of things that can be done and conducted and conceived of and used for education and, and outreach. Uh, and there are people in Hollywood who could write a check for $30 million. And that would be a great yeah. foundation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be very easy to start this and to bring in awesome. kind of capable people, the, the, per, the, uh, the principal investigators and scientists who would uh, run the organization. That's really easy to do. Yeah, it'd bring a lot of people to the Lord, that's for sure. Well, that's uh, also our goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> without any doubt at all. That, that's, that's why this is so... Um, this is so earth-shattering and foundational. Most people do not realize that dinosaurs have soft tissue in them. And, uh, and it changes. I've literally watched it change people's lives. In fact, I've had so much fun with it. You know, like, for example, in a grocery store checkout line. Um, you know, you're bored while you're standing there anyway, right? So when the cashier says, how are you today? Uh, I say, I'm great. I went on a dinosaur dig and suddenly... Everybody in the line is looking at me because everybody <laughs> wants to know about a dinosaur dig, right? And so, and so I say, yeah, we found this 48-inch long triceratops horn, and I do this with my hand, and then I, I say, we brought it to the lab, and we broke it open, and it was full of soft tissue, and I start squeezing, you know, the soft tissue in my arm, and, and their eyes just get really big because they're starting to process the, the, the person who just said, I found a triceratops horn and it was full of soft tissue. I mean, that's a short circuit. And, and you can cut right through all of this indoctrination that people have received and, yeah. and show them, you know, give them a book and show them the cells, show them the nerves and the things that, the vein valves and things that we're finding and say, this can only be here because the flood was real. And you've made a connection. You made a connection that could change that person's life for eternity. Yes, and not just for eternity, and didn't make their life better in this world as well. Yes, <laughs> anyway, right. Matt, say something. <laughs> Sorry. No, I actually got a question from the audience. They ask, uh, Nephilim Free said, has anyone in mainstream science ever told you that they feel bad that uh, you and other scientists have been treated wrongly for your discoveries? You know, that's a great question, and I, and I have had – interactions with uh, some of my colleagues from Cal State University Northridge. Uh, that, that was a fantastic position for me. It was a culmination of my career, um, and, and that's probably why so few people are, are studying dinosaur soft tissues, because it can be a career killer, and it was in my case. Um, you know, I was at the top of my game. At the time, I was treasurer of the Southern California Society for Microscopy and Microanalysis, I'd been a part of the board for some 20 years or so, and uh, running this million-dollar laboratory, teaching, working with students, uh, showing them, training them, mentoring them in how to use electron microscopes and other equipment, confocal microscopy. I was the campus guru for confocal microscopy. That's a half a million-dollar instrument. 
And uh, so I was having a blast. And uh, it's sad that it, it took two or three people uh, to bring the whole thing down for me. And they, they really wrecked the department. They wrecked um, they, they, the excuse that they gave was they didn't have the money to continue to employ me, even though the numbers all showed. We, we found all this out through discovery. All the numbers show that the lab was growing exponentially, the number of students were being added, the number of faculty were being added, all as a direct result of my laboratory. So, um, so yeah, it hurt. It hurt when my career was ripped away from me. And some of my colleagues did privately acknowledge that, um, that they had nothing to do with it and they felt bad. But, you know, when it comes down to that, um, you pretty much just have to walk away. Microscope. Teaching how to use a microscope um, has nothing to do with uh, dinosaur top soft tissue. They're two different things. To teach someone how to do something, and, I mean, you were good at your job. You were very good at your job. And uh, you used to get compliments all the time, and, and, and you had a really good thing there. So, yeah, that was a terrible thing that happened. I, I really um, – but I'm glad everything worked out in the end and, and you got through it. And, and well, today you feel awesome. – And, you know, it allowed me to retire and devote myself fully to this work. And so uh, right now I'm just uh, funding it as, as the funds uh, come in. But uh, yeah. it would be real sweet to have uh, a couple of partners, maybe, maybe a group of partners to come in who have the financial wherewithal to uh, have the vision to, to create the laboratory that really does need to be created. There's very few people working in this area. We think the work is paramount and needs to be conducted and soon, and the world needs to know about it. It does. It does. That's an awesome. Yeah. Okay, Matt. No, I think I'm going to have you ask some questions now. I mean, I, we're only down to about 12 minutes left, man. I, I think you should oh. ask. I, <laughs> oh, well, uh, I, I it's okay. I'll put you on the spot. I'll, I'll ask a question that you think about yeah. some. How's that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so since we're kind of closing up, we're running out of time for you. Uh, we'll have to get you back on, I'm sure. But what are some of the newest discoveries that you're allowed to talk about that you think the that probably possibly coming out this year for people? Right. Uh, well, I mentioned the vein valves um, and the tiny little bicuspids, which are the leaflets inside of the vein valves. Those uh, took up stain really nicely. So, so uh, working vein valves completely intact. In fact, we even videotaped um, uh, bacteria. We, we labeled bacteria with acridine orange, which under fluorescence causes them to glow red because they're saying there's RNA in here. Here's the RNA and it glows red. And so, so we tagged the bacteria with this uh, stain that makes them glow red, kind of orange sometimes, and it was swimming inside of a vein valve that was completely closed. So you could look through, you could look through the vein valve and see the bacteria swimming around in there, but it couldn't get out because it was, it was filled with uh, a water and, uh, and he couldn't, he couldn't swim around in there, but he couldn't get out. So it was proof positive that these vein valves are intact. Uh, I mentioned nerves, um, you know, we're finding intact nerves with even, um, the, uh, let's see, what are they called? The bands of Fontana. If you look up bands of Fontana, we're actually seeing these structures, which are very delicate structures, inside of the nerve sheath. Um, and so uh, how is this possible? How are these, this nerve, how is this nerve tissue still intact and still there, even showing the bands of Fontana? But many other things have been found, as I mentioned previously, and I think there's many more things to discover um, and this is why it's an important area to, to really invest some resources in. Oh, for sure. I got another question from the audience. Do you think that there will come a day when microscopes are able to capture in high resolution video of molecular machines in the cell operating in real time? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really exceeding the limits of uh, certainly electron optics. Um, you know, we, we can image in, in angstroms now with some of this super resolution microscopy. But I don't know. I mean, I'm sure with human ingenuity, I mean, you look at the, you look at the changes in microscopy just over the last uh, three decades, four, four decades. It's been phenomenal um, in what we're able to do. We're, we're actually watching some of these molecular machines uh, using fluorescence. We tag them with fluorescent dyes and we can watch, you know, calcium pumps, for example, and other other molecular machines in operation, but um, 
A lot of the detail is gained from very high resolution transmission electron microscopy, and then it's represented uh, through artist drawings. I kind of like the, the rotating bacterial flagellum, stuff like that. So, but who knows? I mean, uh, uh, we have very resilient people on this planet, very smart people who uh, constantly are amazing me with the things that they're discovering. Oh, the nanobacteria. Did we ask about that? Did you mention the nanobacteria already? already? I think more that I really have no experience in nanobacteria, so I don't think I'm... You had one of your videos that you saw two nanobacteria completely encapsulated and trapped inside of a, in, trapped inside of a, uh, a bubble or, or something. I think that was one of your videos. Was it? Or uh, maybe it wasn't. I'm not, I'm not... It's not ringing a bell with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, Okay. All right, no, it might not have been. It might have been something else. But uh, yeah, it was was it was completely encapsulated, like it couldn't get in or out. You know what I mean? It, there's only one way it could have got in there was just you know like from from the beginning. And this nanobacteria, like when they, you know, sort of whatever they activated it, however that it activated, it, it came back to life. And it, but it was completely trapped within the soft tissue in this bubble. Like it just couldn't have got in. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, later on, or it couldn't get out and it couldn't get in, so it just proved that it went down. So these bacteria are alive inside of these things, and that's what I saw in a video anyway. I saw the little tiny uh, nanobacteria in there. Yeah, that's all. And right. I don't well, know I who it was. Yeah. But you know, you have to understand these these bones have been in the soil, uh, and as I mentioned before, they're being attacked by everything in the soil. And there are organisms that are de designed specifically to break down soft tissues. I mean, that's their role in life, uh, to return those elements back to the soil so they can be uh, reused. And so, um, uh, but I, I don't have any experience with nanobacteria, but, but oh, a I lot of bacteria will, in fact, there's a really neat paper. Nanobacteria can arthritis. There's, a, there's another uh, paper recently. There's a paper that came out recently that talks about how the microbiome inside the bone. There's more organisms inside the bone than in the soil surrounding it. So, I mean, the whole point that I took away from that paper is there's stuff inside the bone that's still there that these microbes are going after. So, um, yeah, and a lot of they're going to spore formation. They'll form a spore until conditions become right again, and then when it's uh, uh, when it, you know, when aqueous solutions come in, they revive, come back to life, and then you can see them grow. But they were probably there from the soil. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I must have uh, misunderstood it, but yeah. Okay. I think it might have been an example of um, all the things that are attacking the soft tissue or something, and I might have mixed it up with something else. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you've pretty much answered everything that 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 I. I mean, you know. <laughs> What could I ask? You've answered every single thing that already all the way through that I wanted to know. So I can't well, think of any if questions. I, up, but, if I yeah. could jump in and ask a few questions, uh, would that be sure, okay? Sure, that'd be good. Yeah. All right, sure. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if Romad asked you this. I forgot if he did. Um, but do, do you, uh, you know, there's a theory out there that's basically saying, well, what you found, the Triceratops horn, the horn that you found was not actually a Triceratops horn, but it was just uh, uh, oh, a right. bison horn, right? Uh, he, he answered yes. Right. So, so my question would be the faulty of the fault. Uh, the, I mean that that argument just falls apart immediately when you ask the question. Was there a huge amount of cartilage found in the Triceratops bone? Because Triceratops bones were made out of bone. Uh, horns were made out of bone, um, and bison horns were made out of, are made out of cartilage. So there would, do you think there would be like a huge uh, difference between the two? And cartilage also is very extremely hard to fossilize. So, was there like a huge yeah. amount of cartilage in there? Well, uh, I didn't find any car cartilage. Uh, remember, the bone was ripped away from the skull and jammed uh, into the dirt, and so um, the all the vessels were facing upwards, all the blood vessels, and so you know rain. And, and mud and you know insects and microbes and bacteria and fungal hyphae and plant roots and all that stuff just had its uh, free uh, you know field day uh, getting into the bone and decomposing it and insects and, so, and um, microbes but um, yeah. what was your question again sorry <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, did you, so the base, the question would, was basically if you found a huge amount of cartilage in there, that would 
pretty much prove that oh, it was right. a bison horn. Right. But I if you found bone, I, it would be a triceratops. I, yeah, no, I found no cartilage. Uh, cartilage has been found. The um, uh, the recent paper by Dr. Schweitzer and her team, uh, uh, they found uh, uh, these cells in cartilage. So cartilage uh, seems to persist uh, as well, although I can't understand how. It's it's much more labile than bone tissue, and so it's more susceptible to decay. Um, so, but yeah, no, cartilage is being found. I didn't find any in the Triceratops horn or in any of the specimens we co collected. They've all been solid bone. Okay, so. Yeah, the freeze. Sorry, go on. Uh, uh, no, I was going to ask a different question, but go ahead, Faithful. I was just going to talk about the freeze thaw cycle, but that would take too long. Go ask your question. No, it's, that's, it's not important. Anyway, no, it's all right. We can get that from somewhere else. Go, Guzman, ask your question. Sorry, mate. No problem. Uh, so. So, uh, is the cartilage like from a dinosaur, or is it from a fossilized uh, bone? The w cartilage that you were talking about, Mary Schweitzer found. Um, I believe it's from a dinosaur, but I'd have to look at the paper again. Uh, like I said, I've been reading so many papers lately that they're all swimming around no together problem. in my head. So, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it was dinosaur, but it's it's also very old cartilage. So. They have found it. Is it is being found? Okay, uh, you can go ahead, uh, Faithful. That's that's my last question. Okay, the, the freeze the freeze thaw cycle um, in Hell Creek is like fifty times a year. It can get it can it can freeze and then and then and then uh, thaw out and freeze. And each time in these microfine cracks in the horn that the water gets into the microfine crack, it freezes and then it splits the crack open a little bit more and then it thaws out and, and, and so on, and then more water comes in and opens up more and more and more. Um, the fact that, that that horn was there at all uh, is just a miracle. I mean, you know, like 53, four cycles a year, it just blows my mind that it was just even wasn't in rubble, in, in wasn't gravel. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And, and like I said, uh, uh, Marge Beige, the ranch owner, was watching that horn for about 30 years. I mean... She'd been all over that thousand acre ranch. She grew up on it. Her family used to camp out in teepees uh, uh, as they used the ranch for cattle uh, in her childhood. So she's lived all over that ranch and she remembers that horn. And uh, she led us there on the final day. And it is amazing that that thing uh, had anything in it at all. And some of the finest preservation, you know, I've been studying. Uh, these osteocytes, a uh, few of us have been photographing osteocytes and presenting those in the literature, and these are the bone cells, and the bone cells have these tiny little thread feet that come out from them because they all, they all touch each other. Uh, once they make this, this collagen carpet that they crawl onto, they all crawl, crawl onto the car carpet that they make, and then they cement themselves in with the bone mineral, but they create these little tubes, and, and they put little thread feet. They're called philopodia, and they touch each other. The cells come together and touch each other uh, in, in, in all three dimensions. And so it's like a living network of bone cells, and they actually, they're so cool because they measure the compression, the cracking in your bones as you're stretching and walking and lifting and running, and, and they, do, uh, they do remodeling. They do what's called bone remodeling, and your entire skeleton is replaced some authors believe every 12 years because of this. So bone is constantly being remodeled. But um, now, I mean, uh, the fact that this horn was subjected to all of these environmental conditions like the freeze-thaw cycle, uh, the radiation, radioactive, for some reason dinosaur bones seem to collect uh, uh, you know, radioactive uh, nuclides. And so they're in there. Uh, giving off radioactivity, and that's horrendous for soft tissue, as you know. So there are so many environmental factors that should have uh, yeah. rendered this bone completely disintegrated, and yet it's full of all the things that we've been describing, and I'm sure we're going to find more things as we go along. What do you, what's it feel like when you hold it? Well, like, what's it actually like? It's very solid and heavy. Um like a um, rock. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like a rock, but uh, and part of it did uh, permineralize. You know, all the water traveling down through the vessels hardened those vessels. So all the blood vessels are hardened. But we dissolved the bone. You know, let's say you have a, a blood vessel here, and, and this is all rock. 
Well, we dissolved all the bone that was around that all the way up to the, to the vessel. And we found bone cells growing along the outside of the vessel wall in the bone. And they had some of the longest filopodia, which is amazing to me because if the iron preservation is going on in the vessel, all these scrubbing bubbles are coming out. It should have chewed up any vessels that were intimately associated with the boat. But these seem to have the, the longest filopodial lengths. So, yeah, it's, it's really a conundrum as to why these tissues are still here, particularly in the triceratops specimens that we found. They're not long bones. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. amazing. And, and, and that's what I was, uh, that's actually what I wanted to ask you. That's my next question. If the whole fossil is permineralized. Um, but basically, it was partially permineralized, but it, just the vessels were covered in like this fossil. And then you were able to disintegrate that fossil to get to the vessel. Uh, no, well, we did, we did find vessels, uh, intact vessels uh, in, in the um, Triceratops rib. We cracked those open and put them under the electron microscope. And the paper, the, the uh, paper in Acta Histochemica, which I have here somewhere, uh, and it's available online. It's available on our website. And you can look at these, these pictures uh, from the paper, and it shows what the blood vessels look like. Even the insides of some of the blood vessels had crystallized blood products in there. And so, yeah, the vessels were completely hardened in the rock, but all the surrounding tissues were still soft. And we were able to, to liberate these into solution. And so uh, you look at the Microscopy Today paper and also the paper that was uh, not only published for the Microscopy Society of America, but I presented that paper. Uh, that's just the proceedings that you read. I presented the paper at the meeting in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the PhDs were just shocked by the things that they saw in my presentation. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, I'm sorry, Matt, you got something to say? Uh, no, I was just giving Guzman a chance, but uh, we're kind of running out of time with you here. Okay. Uh, unless Guzman wants to have a couple more questions, we can. I just want to let the audience know that uh, you have a YouTube channel yourself and how they'll be able to contact you, how they'll be able to find your channel and get a hold of your work. So, um, Guzman, yes. unless any questions. Well, let me just talk about uh, the resources because we do have the YouTube channel. It's just Mark H. Armitage. If you go on to YouTube and search Mark H. Armitage, one word. Uh, and all the videos are there from uh, way back in 2012. In fact, the very first video that shows up is me sitting at a microscope grinning because I actually just found that soft, stretchy fiber of film uh, in the horn. And I was just grinning from ear to ear. And so I ran and got the camera and set it up and recorded everything right away. Uh, and you can see me change through time uh, as you watch the videos. I think there's 60 or 70 of them now. But uh, I wanted to leave it all up there so you could see the whole progression in history of what happened. Um, and, and especially uh, how we grew into the Institute and how we're moving forward today. Uh, so all those are free. You can download those. You can use them, uh, put them in your own videos, send them around. It's, it's free for everybody. And then the website, which is dstri.org, Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute.org. And uh, you can download all the papers. Any future papers that will be published, we'll put right up there. And, of course, the book, Old Stretchy, The Dinosaur Bone Cell, and The Adventure of the Triceratops Horn. Uh, that you can download for free. And pretty soon, uh, Old Stretchy discovers Nano Tyrannus. Uh, that's going to be on the website as soon as we can get it up there. So that's how to reach us. You can contact me through the website, uh, or you can email me, uh, micromark at juno, J-U-N-O dot com. Uh, and that's uh, available all the time. So, yeah, feel free to contact me if you've got questions. Well, well, one last question before yeah, we shut it down, fun. doctor. Uh, this is my last question. Were all your specimens uh, found here in North America? Do you know? Uh, were all the specimens that I've worked on found in North America? Yes. Every specimen that I've worked on is either from uh, the Hell Creek Formation, Lance Formation, uh, or the Texas Red Beds. 
to date. Uh, there are some others that we're working on uh, that we're not ready to disclose the location uh, yet, but uh, mostly from yeah, this the yeah, North American continent. Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Well, if you have any final thoughts, Matt, uh, Jason, or uh, yourself, uh, Dr. Armitage, uh, unless you have any, we'll just shut it down. It was. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say thanks. Uh, we that hour went quick. We we're trying to cram everything in there. I see another question from the audience. If you wanted to answer, if you have time, did uh, sure. some pods have feathers? This question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Oh yeah. Did some theropods have feathers? Well, of course, that's claimed widely in the literature. Uh, I have not studied it uh, personally myself, um, so I'm really uh, not qualified to, to answer uh, that, but it is reported widely in the literature. So I think it's something to, to look at carefully. Uh, I know that there, uh, I remember hearing uh, some charges uh, against uh, the methodology that was used uh, to show those specimens uh, in the very beginning, but I really haven't followed that controversy, so I can't speak expertly on that area. Sorry. No problem. I understand. Um, Jason, would you like to say anything or close us out? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. We've really appreciated your time, and 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 uh, yeah, it's it's been great. Uh, very informative and. Um, I hope that you one day get that funding that you need. I, I'd really like to see it because, like I said, we need to attack this thing from both sides and the dinosaur soft tissue m tissue makes people go sort of, you know, look in, start looking into it and uh, research and then uh, so it's a good thing and then they come to us so in, and they learn about the genetics of it. So, you know, standing for truth and, and, uh, and, and, and Matt and, and myself and Guzman and people like that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I, I hope everything works out for you and, and, uh, everything you know, in, the, in the future. It'd be awesome. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we've uh, corrected some mis, uh, misrepresentations or some misunderstandings. But if not, uh, I answer all questions, and uh, anybody can reach me whenever they want. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. We'll get you on back on the show sometime. So thanks for coming on again. Thank you. We'll do it again. Thanks. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.